Hi everyone, I'm Charlie White and in today's video I'm going to show you how I use this Kingspan K118 insulated plasterboard to insulate the internal walls of my house. Now, I recorded this video about 12 months ago and I was a bit reluctant to put it out there because if you're going to thermally insulate the internal walls of your house, you've got to think about a lot of things from U-values, condensation risk analysis, building regs, consent. And there'll be a lot of people saying that DIYs like myself and you shouldn't be tackling projects like this. But to be honest, insulating our house with this stuff has been such a game changer. It's made our house so much easier to heat, so much warmer. I thought I've got to put the video out there to let you all know about the benefits that you can achieve from doing this. It is a long video today, but there's a good reason for that. I wanted to make it as comprehensive as possible with the idea that if you follow everything you see today, there's no reason why you and I can't tackle projects like this. Now, our old cottage was tyranny and rendered back in the 1970s. The design of it is such that I can't think about insulating from the outside in, which a lot of people do, which is cladding the outside of your house in an insulated material. So I've had to think about insulating from the inside. And the reason why this is important, I'm gradually installing double glazed windows as part of the process of upgrading the house. But there's very little point in just double glazing your windows because in houses like mine where I've got no cavity wall insulation, walls in the rest of the room just act like a massive fridge. So any benefit derived from the double glazing on your windows is a drop in the ocean compared to all the heat loss in the rest of the room. And in our house, because the walls are so cold, we had a lot of problem with condensation and mold forming in cold spots of the room where air wasn't circulating around. By insulating our walls with a K118, suddenly the wall itself feels warm to the touch. And large rooms like this, my daughter's bedroom, which this small radiator was struggling to heat, are now literally the warmest rooms in the house. My daughter finds herself turning the radiator down half of the time during the coldest months of the winter. I've now insulated three rooms in this house using this process. And the point of today's video is to pass on the benefits of my experience as a DIYer doing this to make the point to you that it's actually a really easy thing to do as long as you fully research which insulation is right for your project and what thickness of insulation will achieve the U values that you need, how best to fix that insulation to the wall depending on what sort of walls you've got, and as long as you fully comply with local building control, whether that's building regulations in the UK or around the rest of the world, whatever local standards apply. More on all that coming up in the video. Now, quick word before we start. Everything in today's video is all about Kingspan because that is this product and it's Kingspan that I started buying a few years ago when I started insulating the house. Uh, I've got no loyalties to Kingspan. They don't even know I'm doing this video, let alone pay me to do it. So. It's also not a cheap product. I paid about 45, 50 pounds per sheet for this. So my advice to you would be, you could do what I did, contact Kingspan, find out who the supplier local to you is. I used SIG Group to buy this. The other option is contact your local builders merchants and see what equivalent products they do like this that is thermally insulated and has a vapor control barrier inside. Having said all that, and if you believe Kingspan's marketing, they say the K118 is a premium performance insulation with a special rigid thermoset core. And that means you typically need a thinner amount of insulation to achieve the same level of thermo performance with Kingspan K118 than you do with a thicker comparative insulation. So I guess you get what you pay for. Now, because it's Kingspan that I've used for my insulated plasterboard, obviously I've gravitated to the Kingspan literature on the internet, of which there is a lot. I'll post details in the description at the end of the video of everything that you've seen in today's video, but suffice to say, on the Kingspan Information Hub, their domestic hub, you'll find pretty much everything you need in terms of guides on heat loss, how to minimize it, and as you'll see coming up on the screen now, a complete rundown of all the products that are available that you could use to insulate your walls. But the main information sheet that I've used is this one here, the K118 insulated plasterboard PDF, which you will find details for in the description. You'll find information on both mechanical fixing and also adhesive bonding. Having done both processes, I'm gonna be concentrating on adhesive bonding in today's video because I found this a much easier process than having to attach battens to the wall. If you decide to mechanically fix your insulated plasterboard to battens, as I did when I refurbished our bathroom, where like me, you've got uneven Victorian walls, I had to basically pack out every single batten to ensure that each batten was not only plumb, but also lined up down the wall before I could screw the plasterboard to the 
the wall. Whereas when you're using dot and dab adhesive bonding, you can make up those irregularities in the wall with the different thicknesses of the adhesive dab itself. But remember, while this method is suitable for use on brick, block or concrete cavity or rendered solid walls which are dry, stable and free from moisture penetration, it's not suitable for use on such walls where there is a risk of moisture penetration or on timber or steel frame construction. And one more word of caution about adhesively bonding your insulated plasterboard to the wall. I've been speaking to Kingspan's technical service department uh, in the course of researching for this video and they said to me that where you don't have cavities in your wall, like me, you shouldn't adhesively bond because of the risk of moisture penetration from outside. In this situation they say you should always mechanically fix, i.e. wooden battens and then screw the plasterboard to the battens. I'm not worried in my situation because the outside is Tyrolean rendered and all of the brickwork when I stripped off the render was absolutely bone dry. However, you should always follow manufacturer's guidelines for your own peace of mind, but also because if your wall system does fail because of moisture penetration, you've only got yourself to blame. Okay, so let's have a look at today's toolkit. First tool I used was this Titan SDS drill with a chisel attachment to remove the render off the wall. It's a messy job this, you don't want to inhale any of that dust. So I used this tradesman's mask and also these safety specs that I bought from Screwfix. I've got this plastering bucket from Ox. You then need a bucket trowel to ladle the adhesive out of the bucket onto your plastering hook. The plastering hook is an essential tool when you're applying adhesive bonding. You then use a plastering trowel to transfer the adhesive from the hook onto the wall. In terms of the adhesive itself, I used Giproc drywall adhesive, but actually I kind of wish I'd used the Knauf plasterboard adhesive because that way I wouldn't have had to bond the back of the plasterboard. More on that later. And in terms of applying bonding to the back of the plasterboard as Kingspan say you need to do, if you don't use the Knauf adhesive, I use this Unibon Super PVA. The other option is a thistle bonded, but at over 70 pounds for a 10 litre tub, I wasn't gonna use that. Two other really useful tools, the rasp planer to fine tune the edges of the plasterboard and a universal saw. I actually use my Irwin floorboard saw, but any universal saw. You need to cut the plasterboard with a saw because of the insulation on the back of it. Whereas if you didn't have the insulation, you'd normally score the plasterboard with a Stanley knife and snap it. To mix the adhesive, I use my old Makita drill with a mixer attachment. But if you're doing a lot of this, you're probably going to want to invest in, or better still, hire something like this professional power mixer from Vitrex. Details of all today's tools will be in the description at the end of the video. So I thought it would be useful to run through a few quick do's and don'ts. Firstly, you've obviously got to remove wallpaper skirting, picture rails and gloss paint. If you can't remove all the gloss paint, you can just score it. And you've obviously got to ensure the wall surface is clean, stable and free of dust and loose material. In some rooms where the key between the render and the brickwork is really good, I have been known to leave the render on, but in, in the spare room, you can see here just how loose the render was. It wasn't attached to the brickwork at all. And also by taking the render off, it gave me the opportunity to check that the brickwork behind was completely dry. Now a lot of people get very excited on forums about whether you should or shouldn't apply a bonding agent to the brickwork before you start. There's no reason why you shouldn't do this and Kingspan recommend it where you need to reduce suction or improve the mechanical key. In my situation the brickwork was still quite dusty so I decided to apply a very light watered down coat of PVA so I could be absolutely sure there was no dust left before I started. So you need to ensure the wall is dry. If it's not you must carry out remedial work to remove damp before you start. Now, a couple of other things you've got to think about. Building regs on fire stops. I'll come on to this in a little bit more detail in a minute. And also condensation risk analysis. Now, Kingspan recommend you get a comprehensive U-value calculation along with a condensation risk analysis of your project before you start. And they suggest you consult the Kingspan Installation Technical Service Department for assistance if you need it. So let's have a quick chat about building regs. At least according to my building control officer, if you're insulating more than 50% of the walls in the room, you need building regulations 
approval. Now, building control wants to ensure that your walls are insulated to an acceptable level, and that's where U-values come into play. The U-value of a material is the rate in watts at which heat is lost per square meter of that material. And obviously the lower the U-value, the better the thermal performance. Now, looking at this recommended U-values table for England, you'll see that for new builds, the U-value requirement is lower at 0.16. It's less onerous for extensions at 0.28, and then it's slightly less onerous still for refurbishments at 0.3 or 0.55 if you're looking at cavity wall insulation. So looking at example U values for the Kingspan K118, for solid walls with no insulation, you want to be looking at a minimum thickness for the foam element of the plasterboard of 50 millimeters to get below that magic 0.30 building regs requirement. So just running quickly through a few don'ts. Don't use insulated plasterboard to isolate damp. It's a gypsum based product. If you use it to isolate damp, you're gonna give yourself a load of problems down the line. Don't use it in continuously damp or humid conditions. And don't use it where there's risk of moisture penetration through the substrata, through the external walls. And don't have gaps at the perimeter. Come on to this in a minute, but you need to have a continuous bead of adhesive all the way around the perimeter of the wall. As a general rule of thumb, you wanna apply dabs between 10 and 25 millimeters thick. As you've seen just now, there's no reason why you shouldn't apply a watered down PVA if, like me, you've got a lot of dust to eliminate from the surface. As you'll see in the video, it's a really good idea when you're laying the boards in position before you actually apply the adhesive to draw guidelines on the floor and the ceiling. That way, when the adhesive is on the wall, you can simply press the board into position up to your guidelines. Now, you should allow a 50 millimeter gap between the underside of the board and the floor. I haven't typically done this and it doesn't matter in my situation because all my insulation has been on the first floor and the boards have been resting down onto totally dry floorboards but you've got to allow this gap on the ground floor because you don't want damp getting in from the floor into the underside of the plasterboard. Now applying undiluted bonding agent to the back of the board. So this is the Kingspan K118. You see this foil layer on the back of the plasterboard. If you were buying thermal plasterboard for adhesive bonding a few years ago, you would have bought this product, the K17, that doesn't have the foil lining on the back. There was nothing in the K17 literature about applying a bonding agent to the back of the plasterboard. But for this K118 product, pretty much for all plasterboard adhesives apart from Knauf, you have to apply an undiluted bonding agent to the back of the plasterboard to assist with the bonding to the adhesive. Uh, it is slightly irritating this because you would have thought if they design plasterboard that is suitable for adhesive bonding you wouldn't have to apply an additional bonding agent. I end up buying this stuff. This is Super PVA or a PVAC. Super PVA is polyvinyl acetate and the thing about it is as you can see here it conforms to BS5270 for plastering and at 20 quid a tub less than half the price of the thistle bonded. And you have to apply this in 15 centimeter bands around the perimeter and down the middle of the plasterboard to coincide where your adhesive dabs are gonna be on the wall. So a few final points. You should apply a continuous band of adhesive around the perimeter of each wall and around the openings and the surfaces. This supports the edge and acts as a fire stop. It helps support the plasterboard and it stops insects and things getting behind the plasterboard and nesting. Now, Kingspan say don't bridge the joints with adhesive. I think this is to stop adhesive squeezing through as you press the sheets together. Not sure how important this is, but I think best practice, leave a small gap. Kingspan recommend three vertical rows of adhesive, a minimum of 20% of the plus one area. You'll see I haven't really followed that particularly stringently in my video, but I have covered at least 20% of the plus one area in adhesive. And each adhesive dab should be 50 to 70 millimeters wide and 250 millimeters long. Now the final point is that even with all this adhesive, you're meant to apply a mechanical fixing after the adhesive has set to the plasterboard. Six screws per sheet. Now this is for in the event of a fire to stop the plasterboard sheets falling off the wall and to help secure means of exit. And the fixing of choice in the industry seems to be this plasterboard insulation fixing. Being all metal, it's fire safe. The corkscrew design helps to minimize cold bridging or thermal bridging. It can be hammered straight into the wall where you've got a soft substrata like aircrete, thermalite, or softwood timber. 
where you've got brick, concrete block or a hard substrate like I have, you need to use a five millimeter pilot hole. Then use this neat attachment for your SDS drill bit. You're meant to seal that 50 millimeter gap I was talking about at the base of the wall with a combination of flexible polyurethane foam and flexible sealant or equivalent. This is to stop thermal bridging, which is basically where heat can escape, cold air can get in, in between the bottom of the plasterboard where it's not thermally insulated. So that's quite enough of the theory, let's crack on with the project itself. By marking the position of each board on the wall, when I apply the adhesive, I know where to stop. I've got a long straight piece of metal, which um, was being skipped a few years ago. It proved to be the most fantastic thing because I've duct taped my longest spirit level to it and it produced the most fantastic feather edge stroke level. I like getting them in position first before knocking up the adhesive is so I can take my spirit level, my sort of feather edge with the spirit level attached, I can line up the sheets of plasterboard as near as I'm going to get them with the right gap behind the plasterboard. I can draw a line on the ceiling guideline like this and also on the floor and then when I've applied the adhesive I'm pushing the sheets into place I then know pretty much exactly where the sheets have to go by reference to the marker pen lines so I can push them into place to those lines check the levels so it's a really good sort of guideline straight template to have in place before you start whacking the adhesive on the wall the other thing I use to mark the guidelines on the floor and ceilings is my DeWalt laser level. You see the laser level has put this line along the ceiling which I can then mark and then measure off so it's a really handy tool to have. Right, next step is mixing the adhesive. I've got to say Jipro can't massively helpful on this, they simply say mix to the desired consistency. You'll find that the more you practice this, the better the consistency you'll achieve. Okay, I've got just over a quarter of a bucket of water into which I'm applying the Jiproc drywall adhesive. Got an old Makita drill which is not really suitable, you really want a bespoke mixing drill. Still a bit sloppy. it to be sort of firm enough to form on the wall. I think we need a little bit more than that. This has a really nice sort of Really nice stiffness to it now, so that'll be perfect on the wall. One thing I've learned over the years is the importance of cleaning tools as I go along. If you uh, stick this in another bucket while it's still wet, you've got a lovely clean mixer ready for the next batch. If 
first job I've got to do is to apply a continuous line of adhesive. consistency right when it just sort of sits on the hawk like that without moving if it's a bit too sloppy that would not you wouldn't be able to do that if you have got it nice and thick you also keep the workspace nice and clean because you don't get lots of sloppy adhesive dabs falling on the floor And by applying adhesive all around the opening of the services, in this case the electrics, I'm not only supporting the plasterboard, but I'm sealing it at that point. Time to lift the first plasterboard sheet to place. Now remember the guidelines I put on the floor, they're going to come into their own now. If I can manhandle my sheet to place until it's flush with the lines that I marked on the floor. So I now know that's in the perfect position. We'll double check we're level with the spirit level, that looks absolutely spot on. There's a little bit of a bulging in the plasterboard in the middle at the top. So that tells me I'm going to push it in at the top. To line up with those marks I made on the ceiling. Now when I put my spirit level against the plasterboard it's beautifully flat and there are no gaps between the feather edge and the plasterboard. I should point out that for the sloping sections of the ceiling, I did actually mechanically fix these with drywall screws by screwing the plasterboard to the rafters beneath. The horizontal section of the ceiling did not require any additional insulation because I recently had the loft fully insulated. So that's it really, except to say make sure on your internal corners and your reveals that the insulation is continuous so that you avoid any break in continuity of the insulation and therefore additional heat loss. So I really hope I've sort of demystified a process that has seemingly so many different opinions about the right way to do it. I'm not saying everything that I've done is right, probably the way that I've applied the adhesive has been a bit messy, but ultimately I want you to realise that a process like this is not out of the reach of us DIYers. Check out the description at the end of this video for a detailed rundown of everything I've used in today's video and also where I got the plasterboard from, which was from the SIG group. I hope you find the information useful and if you've got any queries about anything, drop me a comment in the comment section below. So if you've liked today's video, please click on the like button below and as I always say, if you're new to my channel, I would absolutely love to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here.